Okay. All right, we should be live now. We should be live. I got the I have the controls above me on the next screen up, so I'm going to be looking up a lot during the stream. Okay. Um, anyway, all right. Frank Jastremski, thank you for joining me. Uh, it's it's good to see you, not in person, but actually to be able to see you. We've talked on the phone before. Um, but thank you for, for joining us on this stream. There's a, a good number of people here who are with us, and basically everybody is an SS Atlantic enthusiast. And I'm sure they know who Reverend Ancient is. We talked about him a little bit in that documentary, how he was one of the heroes of the SS Atlantic disaster. Not the first person on site who did not lead the rescue, but he concluded it, we'll say. Uh, but before we go into that... Frank, why don't you uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and what you're doing? Okay, well, my background, my day job, I'm an editor, uh, an associate editor with a company based in Wisconsin. Um, but my real passion is writing and researching about history, um, mainly military history, but a little bit of everything. Um, I run an organization called Shrouded Veterans, where I track down um, Mexican War, American Civil War veterans buried throughout the United States or the world. Um, and neglected or unmarked graves. Um, and that, with a lot of that, um, I'm able to find these veterans and place graves at, or place markers at their graves. Um, and I'm working on a number of projects, like I said, throughout the United States and through the world. I'm, I'm working on a project in Colombia right now and uh, Peru. Um, and I'm fortunate the U.S. government will actually send a, send a, a marker to a veteran veteran's grave if you can prove that they're they, they served and that they also are buried in that location for free so um that has really made it my job a lot easier um getting these graves marked and also the people at these cemeteries and research and researchers and everyone else that's participated and helped me has been awesome um so yeah that's a little bit about what i do in my free time all right so you uh you track down unmarked U.S. military graves, and yes. um, and you get them marked with through the help of the U.S. military. Is it the military, or is it a different branch of government? So it's the Veterans Affairs, the Department of Veteran Affairs. Okay. So they'll they'll mark any grave of a veteran. Um, like I said, as long as they're you can prove they're buried there, and you can prove um, their military service. Um, now they're a little. They require the consent of a descendant if they're buried, if they served in World War One or later. Mm -hmm. But anything before that's free game. So a lot of the guys I'm focusing on are Civil War veterans, uh, like I said, Mexican War. Um, I did. I'm working on a Revolutionary War one actually, um, but I mainly the 19th century is really where I do a lot of my work. Quick question: Do you do uh, both sides of the Civil War? Yes, yes, I do. Um, I, I've done it. I had a Confederate officer that I did recently. Um, he he was actually served in the Mexican War and he was in the Confederate Army, um, and he was buried at Congressional Cemetery, which is in D.C. Um, and I'm trying. I have another guy I'm working on um, that I actually he's buried in Virginia. Mm -hmm. He was in Confederate, and he was same deal. He was in the Mexican War and um, in Confederate service. But wow. the Mexican War has a special place in my heart. Um, mainly because I feel like it's the forgotten war right. that happened before the Civil War. Um, and a lot of those guys who fought in the Mexican War ended up fighting in the Civil War, but it just, it kind of gets overshadowed by the Civil War. So yeah. I give them kind of special attention and treatment. Well, we've got, uh, we have people coming in, and uh, the chat is quite uh, active. Uh, I am watching it, by the way, guys. I see you saying I'm not watching it, so there's your proof that I am talking about my beard, and the question about if you uh, do graves for both sides of the war actually came from the chat. Now, um, I think what you're doing is awesome. I think that's a very noble cause, but you're not just doing U.S. military graves, it seems. In fact, that is why we're all here on this stream right now. Um, you are leading a campaign on GoFundMe to put a gravestone on Reverend Ancient's grave up in Halifax, which is currently unmarked. Um, for those of you who don't know, Reverend Ancient was the priest, the Anglican priest of the uh, Lower Prospect, Terence Bay area. 
at the time of the sinking of the SS Atlantic, and the SS Atlantic basically crashed into his um, into his town up on the rocks. And well, why don't we uh, talk a little bit about what he did? And before we go into what he did during the wreck, you know more about his life than I do and his career. So let's talk about him. Why? Um, what did he do, and why do you feel he? deserves this. I mean, he obviously deserves this, but what motivated you to take this task on? Um, well, I guess I'll just talk about him first a little bit, and then I'll talk about why I got motivated. Um, so he was born in 1836 in England, um, and he ended up joining the Royal Navy in 1854 at the age of 18. Um, and he was in Royal Navy service up until 1863. But during that time, that's when he really, religion started becoming part of his life. Uh, he started attending uh, Bible readings on the ships, or on his ships, different ships he was assigned to. Um, and yet, actually, after he left the service, he joined the Royal Navy Scripture Reader Society, and that's really what kind of spurred him to become hmm. a clergyman. Um, and with that society, he traveled to Nova Scotia, um, and he was eventually ordained, ordained a priest in 1872. Um, and assigned to the Terence Bay mission. So he was new. Um, he was new to the priesthood. Yes. Yes. So he had no previously, the Royal Navy, the, he was in the Royal Navy, and then ended up, like like I said, um, religion kind of started influencing his life, and then he decided to slowly start moving towards that direction to becoming an ordained priest, an Anglican priest. Hmm. Um, so I guess I'll talk a little bit about how I got interested in him. Um, in 2017, I had a chance to go up to the Maritime Museum with my wife um, in Halifax, and it, it, it's a great museum if, you, if people haven't been there. I mean, they've got all kinds of exhibits there set up for different disasters and wrecks um, besides the Titanic, um, and they have an exhibit on the Atlantic Museum there, or the Atlantic disaster set up, and they have some different artifacts in there, and I noticed that the Reverend Ancient was mentioned um, and it also, they have his gold watch that he was awarded after the incident there. Um, so I just, I thought that was interesting that they had mentioned this, this priest was involved with this rescue operation. Um, and I, I have a tendency, and I've done this since I've been a kid, I've, I kind of file away interesting people um, in a notebook that I, at some point I'll come back to and write mm -hmm. about or research. Um, so it just happened to be I'm working on a project with him, and I... With anyone who I start writing about or researching, um, I, I've, I've gotten into a habit of actually like finding out where they're buried and kind of the conditions of their graves. And that has a lot to do with me running Shrouded Veterans. So I reached out to the individual in charge at, of the cemetery where he's buried and asked, hey, what, you know, what's the condition of his grave? Um, can you let me know? And he sent me a photo and he notified me that was unmarked. So... You know, I was thinking, I gotta, I gotta get him a grave. I mean, this guy who was involved in this heroic effort, um, he was a clergyman. Like, he, he should have a headstone for sure. So I asked the individual who's in charge um, how I can go about doing this, um, and he mentioned that I needed to get the consent of a descendant, which isn't completely uncommon. I mean, it, it's about fifty-fifty here in the United States, even. They, some some cemeteries require you have the consent of a descendant to request a headstone. Some of them don't. Well, mm -hmm. they, they did. So I, I actually put out a question on Facebook on different genealogical Nova Scotia pages, which have been really helpful. Some of these Facebook genealogical pages mm -hmm. have been really great with people because people do it. And they love it. It's a passion of theirs searching for these people. So I was I pretty much put it out there being like, hey, can someone help me track down his dis living descendant? And someone gave me a name of John uh, Sissam, S-I-S-A-M. And he was, I believe he was in Toronto. So I did some research and I managed to find he owned a company in Toronto. So I emailed him and I was like, John, you know, this is kind of weird, <laughs> but I'm this guy trying to get this grave for your ancestor. I want to put it, um, I, I want to put a headstone at, on his grave. Um, I need your consent. A notarized consent is this something you'd be willing to do and he said yeah totally and he got the notifi notarized consent and sent it to the cemetery so that was the first hurdle getting that done <laughs> um so then i began to explore okay what am, how am i going to get him a headstone i can't request a headstone for him like right. i do here in the united 
United States because he wasn't a he was a Royal Navy veteran, but I'm not aware of any organization that allows or that will send a headstone for free like they do here in the United States for a veteran. Um, now, the Commonwealth Graves Commission, I believe, will do anyone, any British veteran that died in World War One or World War Two, but they won't handle 19th century veterans. Right. So that kind of eliminated doing that. So I, so I had to get a private marker done. Um, so I ended up so yeah, I, so the the guy in charge of the cemetery left, gave me a, a name of a preferred preferred memorial vendor. So I contacted them and had them put together a design that I had sent to his descendant, ancient's descendant. Said, "Hey, does, how do you like this? Does this look okay?" And he said, "Yeah." And I actually talked to the SX Atlantic Heritage Museum too and said, "Hey, you guys, you know, I wanted to make this look. Um, his, I wanted all the information to be, you know, as historically accurate as it can be, and that both." both these people have a stake in this hat kind of gave my, gave their approval. Right. So they both did. Um, and so they gave me a quote, which was, you know, a little over $3,000. So that's when I started trying to raise funds. I created the GoFundMe page. I've been trying to reach out to people just to kind of, you know, pay, you know, raise money just so I can right. put this up. Um, now the thing is, is interesting. I one of the people who contributed to the go on the GoFundMe page was Sarah, Sally Gerhardt and her husband Billy Gerhardt, and he was on the History Channel's Oak Island Curse of Oak Island show. Right. And they have a memorial company, and they, you know, corresponding with Sally, she had mentioned that she would be willing to do the same memorial, but for five hundred dollars cheaper, which I thought was great. You know, she. She reached out to me and let me know that. So I, that's the memorial company I, I'm going to go with. Um, so they're going to go cheaper. Start, they're going to go cheaper, yeah. and they gave you a contribution. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that was really cool and thoughtful of them. And, you know, it was just really interesting hearing that they had these ties to the History Channel series. And, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah, so right now I'm kind of at the point where um, I'm just trying to raise funds right. to get it done. And that's um, actually one of the reasons why I wanted to do the stream to help you out with that. I know that there's lots of Atlantic enthusiasts now, and um, I wanted to make them aware of this stream. The GoFundMe link is actually in the description of this of this stream right now, if you want to go and support. And one thing that I I, I have two asterisks, two additions that I want to say before doing that. Uh, number one, I've talked with the um, Titanic Society of Atlantic Canada, which encompasses Nova Scotia as part of its domain, and they um, they are willing to match up to $100 for any contributions from their members. So if you are a member of that society and you contribute, uh, let me know, let them know, and they would be willing to match up to $100 total. Um, so once there's a combined total of $100, they will throw 100 towards this as well. And secondly, from me, what I'd like to um, do is from here on, like starting now during this stream through the end of this uh, coming weekend. So I know there's a lot of people who want to see this who are not coming in right now, can't tune in live, but will watch this archived later. Whoever contributes the highest amount, I hate to make it sound like it's some sort of a competition, but uh, the largest contributor, I have a, a little token of gratitude that I'd like to send you. Uh, two little ones, actually. The first is a piece of porcelain that is from the cargo hold of the SS Atlantic that I found when I was up there. It is off the ship. It is not White Star Line China. It is just a piece of China that was being carried as part of a large shipment within the ship's forward cargo holds and broke out during the wreck. And in addition to that, the remnants of what I believe is a nail, uh, it's, a, it's a metal piece of some sort, heavily corroded, but it is from St. Paul's Church, which was Reverend Ancient's church at the time of the Atlantic disaster. So two artifacts that are connected to Reverend Ancient and the SS Atlantic. As a token of gratitude, I definitely believe in this cause that you're doing, and I would love to see support for it as much as possible. I know that some people do like to give super chats during this, uh, during my streams. I ask that you don't 
during this. And if you were thinking of contributing anything to a super chat, throw it at that GoFundMe, please. Uh, the link is in the description. I think it's fantastic, and I want to see it happen. Um, now let's talk about the man himself. Um, during the Atlantic disaster, I, I always kind of found it dryly humorous how, um, how he discovered what was going on. See, being the, uh, the local Anglican priest, he usually was able to visit homes and they would cook breakfast for him. Uh, they, they took care of him as part of the community. The community supported him. And he went to where he was supposed to go for breakfast that morning, knocked on the door, and found no breakfast. And then he realized no one else is around town. So there's like a sequence of events here where first he realizes no breakfast, and then he realizes no one is really in town. And then he goes out looking, someone points him in the direction of the wreck site, tells him what happened, and then he gets out there. Um, when he arrives on scene, the rescue had essentially concluded. Almost everybody was off. It was early afternoon by this point, so um, some people, especially back then, believed that Ancient led the rescue efforts falsely when he did not. In fact, he refuted that claim himself. He said, no, I showed up very late. Um, stop calling me the leader of the rescue. But he did get there at about 1 or 2 in the afternoon. Most of the rescue had ended by about 10 or 11 in the morning. And he gets there to the island, Mars Island, where the ship is wrecked. He can still see the ship there. He can still see the masts sticking up out of the water. He can still see first-class passenger Rosa Bateman tied and dangling from the top of the mast, a very grisly sight. But most importantly, he sees two people still alive clinging to the same mast, calling for help. There's hundreds of men on the beach. Or it's not really a beach, it's a, it's, a, it's a rocky shore, but hundreds of men there. No one's going out. In fact, everybody there has already accepted the fact that there's no rescuing those two who are still stuck on the mast. There's, there's no point in going out there because it's, it's a suicide mission. So he actually started gathering people and saying, well, get me in a boat, come out with me, put me on that ship, and I'll rescue them. And I believe you had a... Do you have a quote about that? I think you said you had a quote written down. Or are we not there yet? Yeah, um, more when he's on the ship. Right, right, okay. So he manages to get a boat together. They had boats there already that had been going back and forth between the wreck and the, and the rock and then the shore. And he managed to get a few people very reluctantly to come out with him and start rowing because the water was getting more and more rough. Um, supposedly somebody on the boat was drunk with him. I don't know if that part's true. He either slapped him into shape or he, he kicked him off the boat. Um, but they managed to get out to the wreck. And they couldn't get close enough. Now, there was... The, the two people on the wreck were a boy and Officer Firth. Fifth Officer Firth. The boy is actually a cabin boy. It's, it's the rank of boy, which is an official rank on, on these ships. He's not the only child to survive. He's not John Hanley. It was the, a cabin boy who I don't believe has been identified. Maybe it has. Look for Bob Chalk's book. Maybe he talks about it then. But he jumps into the sea, and they manage to pull him aboard. But what happens next? Frank, you, uh, oh, you want to take so, it from here? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so they take the boy back to the shore, drop him off, and then they go back out. Um, and that's when the ancient, really, the, the best part of the story, I guess, is when he goes back. So they get back to the ship, or the shipwreck, mm -hmm. and ancient gets close enough. They pull the, his fellow people in the boat, pull him close enough in the boat. He gets on the hull of the ship climbs into the rigging and he sees Firth in there. So Firth has been up in the rigging for at least 10 hours. I mean, he's, you know, he's exhausted. He's, he can't swim. Apparently that's what I've read. Mm -hmm. So 
he's, he's the lone survivor left on this ship. Um, so Ancient gets a rope, ties it up, ties it together, throws it up to Firth, tells him the wrapper tied around his waist, um, and then yells to him, now put your confidence in man and the Lord and move when I tell you. So he yells, to, yells that to Firth. Well, Firth starts to climb down. He slips and actually falls down, and he, he yells, he hits his leg, I believe on, he must have hit it on the ship um, when he was coming down. And he yells out to Ancient that his he broke his shins. And Ancient, that's when Ancient yells to him, never mind your shins, man. It is your life we're after. And that's kind of, that's the quote I actually wanted to put on the grave because I just thought that's a powerful quote coming from Ancient. Um, so he ends up getting Firth to the boat and gets him on the boat. Um, and then they get him back to shore. And he survived. Um, and after the fact, Firth tells newspapers, or he, I have a quote from Firth to the one, one of the newspapers, um, that he said, I was then so exhausted and benumbed that I could hardly, that I was hardly able to do anything for myself. And but for the clergyman's gallant conduct, I must have perished soon. Um, so he really looked at ancient as saved. I mean, ancient saved his life, mm -hmm. um, and he owed his life to ancient. Um, so I don't know. Should we talk a little bit about after the fact about ancient? Yeah. Um, kind of. Yeah. So he, I mean, he was involved with burying the victims after the fact, but he was kind of portrayed as like like um, Tom had mentioned, the main guy, the main rescue, you know, that led this operation. And he really didn't, he shied away from taking the credit away from the other people that were involved in this. Because there were a lot of other people that saved, I mean, they saved hundreds of passengers during this time. He saved one passenger, but it was still a heroic act. Um, and he, he got all kinds of praise from in Canada and England and even in the United States. Um, he had a, num a number of uh, organizations sent him things like money. Um, they um, gold medals he received. He received some medals. Um, I mean, this was uh, kind of the highlight of his life. I mean, he drank. He was for that period of time. He was a celebrity. Um, but after that, he kind of. I mean, he remained in the church, but he, he never reached. You know, he never held that kind of celebrity status. Celebrity status again. Um, and that's kind of where we end up. He dies in 1908. Um, and I have, so far, I haven't been able to establish if he was buried without a headstone mm -hmm. um, or if he had a headstone and it just, you know, right. over time war. I'm guessing it probably, he probably did have a headstone at some point. It's just, if you look at the photo of the cemetery, a lot of those those tombstones that are around there look like they're marble and they're worn and they can right. be easily cracked or splintered and fall over and they just over time you know they get covered up with the ground or they just fragment pieces um some cemeteries will actually discard the leftover tombstone fragments i mean so it's possible they could have been discarded um but i i'm, I'm guessing he was buried with a headstone i would say right um i can't see how someone like him would would not have been marked Marking is a sign of respect, and I. They would definitely do that. There, he had a lot of respect from his community, and throughout Halifax. I understand he was not always at uh, Lower Prospect. He actually did move into the city later in life, I think. Um, yeah. And he always commanded a, a lot of respect. He was a mariner uh, in the British Royal Navy, so uh, he had not just the spiritual respect and admiration from his community as their um, priest, but also he was almost seen as one of them because he was skilled. Uh, he was a skilled sailor, especially as demonstrated during the wreck. Um, so the fishing village of Lower Prospect liked him and saw him as like the perfect priest for them. It's probably why he got sent out to them, quite honestly, because of his... Uh, mariner experience um so we did by the way or you did get a uh, couple more contributions uh we have two we have an anonymous donor of 25 who gave about four minutes ago and robert mccray who was here in the stream yesterday as well gave five dollars so thank you to both of you uh oh, thank you that's a step closer to to get yep. these stones and again to reiterate whoever um 
is able to give the largest contribution towards this by the uh, the end of this weekend. I will contact. Please contact me um, if you go to my YouTube channel, and uh, there's a email address. If you go to that and go through the anti spam filter, send me an email and just let me know um, what you contributed and. We'll talk, and then I'll get this sent out to you as a, a token of appreciation. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, so let's talk about the stone design that you were working on. Let me pull that up. I have a uh, image of it here that I... That's not it. That's not it. See, I can't see the file names. There it is. Got it. All right, so... Um, here it is. Uh, do you want to read it off? Do you, like, do you have it in front of you, or...? Yeah, I, actually, I, I wrote it down. Beautiful. So yeah, I have it right in front of me. So it just, the top obviously just has his name, Reverend William Johnson Ancient. And mm -hmm. then it has his birth date and death date, which is February 25th, 1836 to July 20th, 1908. And then I wanted to include the mention of his his act, yeah. um, his rescuing of Firth. So I had it, I want. I would like to have it inscribed on fe April 1st, 8th. On April 1st, 1873, four volunteers led by Ancient rescued the last survivors of the SS Atlantic shipwreck. And then I put the quote, never mind your shins, man, it is your life that we are after. Um, and there's actually, I wanted to include an image of him on there, mm -hmm. which I think that's, I don't know, I want something that's in the cemetery where, you know, someone's passing through like, whoa, what's that? I want to yeah. go look at that. And that's, um, you know, it's great putting an image of someone with a grave. I mean, regardless if they're well known or not, um, it, it makes it tangible. It makes you yeah. feel like you can actually connect to it and um, more personable. I I think this is a beautiful design, and I I like the inclusion of both his defining moment and the the photograph of him. Um, if you are unable to contribute, at, at least share the GoFundMe link. Uh, just to help get the word spread, and I'd, I'd really like to see them be able to do this. So, um, I got a question for you. About how many headstones have you placed in the past? You, I'm sure you don't have an actual count, but you've been doing this for a well, while, right? So I've been doing it about two years now. Oh, okay. So... So I always say I don't consider a headstone done until I have a photo of it and right. it's been placed. Now, there are a lot of, like, pending applications I have where I've sent them out. And it, I mean, it's, it could take months to get the headstones placed. I mean, it has to go. So I have to fill out the appropriate pap paperwork and show the documentation. That needs to go to the cemetery. They need to complete a portion of it, mm -hmm. and they need to send that to the VA. And the VA approves or declines it. Right. cuts the stone if they approve it and then they have to ship that back to the cemetery and then the cemetery has to install it so this all takes time um so i i def i think i've complete like considered completed somewhere around 30 or so um pending i mean probably double that i mean i don't want to over exaggerate but i i have i mean i've been really sending out i try to send out at least 10 applications a week um I mean, there's so many graves that are unmarked or bad, really bad. I mean, and that's, there are the ones that are neglected that just need cleaned. And that's, you know, that's a different thing I do too, or have done. But um, the hardest thing I run into is some cemeteries require installation fees hmm. to install the headstones. Some of them will waiver them because they're veterans, but some require installation fees. So I have to raise the funds for those. Um, so, and they can range anywhere from, $200 to 1000 I mean, yeah. it's all based on the cemetery, what their policies are. And, um, so, yeah, I mean, I've, I started with Union generals. I started with major generals or brigadier generals that fought in the Civil War, and it kind of went down a list and figured out where they're all buried and then found the ones that weren't marked, and I started doing brevet brigadier generals. Um, and I went through all them, did them, you know, kind of went through the list and found out where they're at. Now I'm doing colonels, union colonels. And then I scatter in, you know, like I said, there's some Confederate officers or um, officer. I have the one officer I've mentioned that fought in the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of them, you know, I might go to a cemetery and say, hey, I know there's a grave on Martha, this individual. 
I would like to put a headstone there. They might come back to me and be like, oh, that's great. We also have four more of these other guys that are buried here at unmarked graves. So then it turns into, yeah. you know, instead of just doing one stone, it's five stones. Um, and I recently got involved with a project in Pittsburgh. They reached out to me and told me that they had about 40 graves oh, wow. that were either unmarked or badly neglected. Um, from, from what time frame? Me, are these Civil well, War? Civil War, Spanish-American War, most wow. of them, I've, I've noticed so far. I'm still kind of researching them to figure out um, what, because some of that information they provided wasn't 100% accurate. I mean, it, it has some of them listed as being Spanish-American War veterans when they were Civil War or vice right. versa or something like that. But they're all either Civil War or um, Spanish-American War so far. Um, but their graves are to the point where you, I mean, most of them you can't even read. Yeah. Um, and the VA will replace... They will replace a private marker if it's so badly damaged that you can't really read it or anything. You actually have to remove it and then put a government marker there, mm -hmm. government-issued marker. Okay. So. Uh, we have a question in the chat here. If the survivors hadn't immediately left the ship, would they have been able to just swim off later? In other words, did the sea calm down later in the day while the ship's hull was still in, uh, above the water? Um I don't believe it got calm until the following day, uh, so they would have really had to cling to the ship for 24 or 30 hours. So there's, by that point, you'd just be utterly exhausted, exhausted if not having already died from the elements and the exposure. Um, it was cool. freezing cold. Um, we're, we're talking Titanic temperatures. Truthfully, I don't know if there's an actual record of how cold it was, but it had been snowing just an hour or two prior to the disaster. There was still snow on the ground, um, and the waves were buffeting the ship from all places. Um, a lot of the people were just straight up swept off the ship, and the ship was collapsing. So, obviously, we do have 5th Officer Firth and the boy who were able to cling to the ship for, how long was that? 10 hours, 12 hours by that point? Yeah, Firth had already been up there for 10 hours. And yeah. that, the young lady that passed away, um, I mean, she died of hypothermia, mm -hmm. from what I understand. I mean, I, I find it hard to believe that Firth would have been able to hang on for another 10 hours. No. I mean, he, from what it sounds like from the accounts that I've read and what he's, he has said, it sounds like he was literally hanging on by a string, yeah. you know. Um, and when, yeah. when the boy jumped into the sea... Um, I had read one account that says he didn't actually even jump. He kind of just went limp and dropped into the sea. So yeah. it, it really was just, they were hanging on by a thread, as you said, after just 10 hours. I think if they had to go another, even an hour, they might not have made it. Um, I, I don't know when Rosa Bateman passed, which kind of makes me wonder had they been able to get out to them an hour prior maybe she could have been saved as well, and there could have been at least one woman saved. Uh, but but no, they, they had to get off that ship. It's it's kind of hard to fathom because the ship is st sitting there so close to the shore, it's kind of hard to fathom how if you just get a good grip, can't you just make it? But there's so many elements that you just, you have to really imagine just how much was truly against them beyond the simple state of the ship. Um... Let's see. Um, speaking of, we have the president of the Titanic Society of Atlantic Canada in the chat, by the way. I had mentioned previously that if any members are here in the chat and are able to contribute, the society is willing to match up to $100 combined for everybody. And um, we've gotten more contributions, by the way. Quite a few more. Uh, Excellent. Well, two more. We have Alexander Moeller, who is a society member. So there's that. That'll be matched. And then Thomas Henderson as well. And uh, thank you both for, uh, for that contribution. And again, as I said, reiterating, I will be uh, sending out a thank you gift to the highest contributors of the weekend. Um, if any of you have questions about um, Ancient or um, Frank's effort here, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat. In the meantime, I'm happy to take Atlantic questions, and I know that Frank is also able to weigh in quite a bit, um, because when you start looking for a, a subject, I've seen that you you look into it. You, you really like to get 
authentic information and make sure that you seem to go a little bit beyond just the cursory level. And I think that's really nice. It's like the historian training, you know, uh, yeah. you know, my graduate training, you know, where it's question everything, you know, um, even the sources you're getting, what, you know, what's the perspective this person's taking on this? Is, is there motivation for them to say one thing or another thing? I mean, so that's where that comes from, really. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's, it's admirable. And there's a lot of people, I, I don't think you would be going as far into this line of work if you didn't have that passion for history. But, but still, it's, it's good to know that you actually care in what, uh, about what you're doing. Uh, somebody is asking about the animation that um, is on my channel. Was the water really as turbulent as it is shown in the reenactment prior to hitting the rocks? Um, that's a tough call. There's, there's really not that many records as to just how turbulent it was offshore because when you're out there, it's mostly just swells and not water breaking so much. So it's, the ship is able to ride it a little bit better. Unfortunately, with that animation, the ship is not physically interacting with the water. So it, it would really be riding the waves and not necessarily getting clipped through. But um, at the time, there was no real way to easily animate that. Uh, but it was turbulent, and quite honestly, I think the water was more turbulent than shown during the wreckage part. Uh, yes, uh, alright, another question is, uh, what, the kid who survived, John Hanley, um, I always mix up the pronunciation, I even forget the, <clears throat> I even forget the, uh, actual correct way of saying it now, um, but he survived and was pulled out of the porthole in the forward section. He would not have survived, by the way. He, uh, I actually have a picture of him that I could pull up as well, alongside Ancient, right there. He was supposed to be quartered in the mid section. It's actually the after middle section, not the perfect middle. I actually got the documentary wrong. Um, where I show where each group of people was quartered. I actually have the plans since then, so now I know exactly where they are, and I was a little off. But he would have been quartered with the families in the after middle section of the hull. So he would not have survived if he did not get permission from his parents and the crew to spend the night in the forward section of the ship with the single men with his older brother who was quartered there always. So he was 12 years old. He wanted to be a, an adult. He wanted to be a man. So he actually got permission to spend that night in particular with the adult men in the forward section. And that is why he survived. Uh, supposedly he was yanked out a porthole by his hair. But I don't know if that part is true. Um, let's see. So, uh, Frank, you said you, you became interested in the Atlantic by visiting from the uh, Maritime Museum, correct? Yes. Yeah, so I planned a trip with my wife in 2017. We went up, um, went, came up to Nova Scotia, um, so we hadn't been before. Um, and part of it was research, I guess, motivated, too, because I was writing about William Paul, uh, Victorian Cro Victoria Cross recipient mm -hmm. that's buried in Nova Scotia. So he's so I went to his grave too when I was up there, um, and yeah, we just I I put that I had read about the Maritime Museum and I thought definitely I definitely need to check it out. And, um, yeah, I, I mean I I was very impressed with the artifacts. I mean I still have photos of the artifacts that I saw there and took on my phone and um, and obviously it inspired me to start this project you know with Ancient and write about him and research him and. Actually, I was going to mention, I, I've been trying to research a little bit about his naval service mm -hmm. a little more um, and try to track down where he went on the ship he was on, different ships he was right. assigned to. And I, I haven't 100% been able to verify everything, but I, I noticed that he, um, he, he, served, he, he enlisted during the Crimean War. He didn't see any service during mm -hmm. the Crimean War. From what I understand, he was in, his, his ship was stationed in the Baltic, essentially to kind of contend with any Russian fleets that would come through the Baltic right. um, to come try to invade England or, you know, anything along those lines. But I think,
think he was actually he ended up going the, the ship that I think that he was on at the time was down went down to the Caribbean at one point um, and survived a hurricane that almost took the ship out um, and I was reading that it stopped in Nova Scotia at one point before going down to the Caribbean so there's it's possible he could have been exposed to or at least had seen right. been to Nova Scotia before traveling there mm. you know with the uh, scripture reader society and then becoming a priest um, and then I was noticing too I, I came across the source that said should be that I believe he's he was on um, went to the African coast or Af- the African coast near uh, modern day Mozambique mm-hmm. and they delivered dispatches to Livingston so Dr. Really? Livingston um, so it's just funny I'm reading you know he may have been on the sh- these ships that have kind of been involved in all these different other things oh, wow. you know that are kind of kind of cool and remarkable and I like I said I, I'm still trying to make sure you know verify 100% he, he was on these sh- ships at the time which it's it's kind of hard with naval records that early yeah. but um, I'm kind of tracking the path of some of these ships and I don't know. So he sounds like he kind of had a remarkable naval career before even leaving the service. Right. Worth mentioning. I mean, those guy, a lot of those guys from the 19th century that um, served in the Royal Navy. I mean, they traveled the world. I mean, it's crazy. He well, saw yeah. all kinds of things. Join the Navy, see the world. Yeah, exactly. Um, I wrote about a guy, Admiral Markham, um, Albert Hastings Markham. I mean, he was a Arctic explorer, and he. Um, he had, he had been to South America and kind of observed a war that was there, and then he went to um, the Pacific and mm-hmm. was involved in some of the slave tra- stopping the slave trading going on. I mean, it's just, I don't know. And then he was involved in some of the opium wars. Wow. So, yeah, it's just crazy the exposure these guys got um, on these ships to different conflicts and different events. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It just blows my mind. It is unbelievable. There's there's so many journals that were kept by officers that have gotten since published, and they're so fascinating to read. Just all the different stories they have in the different parts of the world. I mean, you can yeah. see you can see why there were TV shows and movies about the adventures in the Royal Navy at the time, like you know Horatio Hornblower and such. Oh yeah. Um, I saw a question come up in the chat, which um, I actually wanted us to discuss a little bit, but completely forgot. So, where is Reverend Ancient buried? I know the spot is known and documented. Yeah, so he's buried at St. John's Cemetery in Halifax. Um, and, yeah, they have, I don't know, I have the photos of, like, the actual location. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I couldn't tell you off the top of my head the actual, like, plot he's in. Right. Like, But the cemetery has those records of where he's buried um, to verify it's that's the spot. Um, so you'll be sure when the stone is placed, you'll know he's, he's resting under it. Yes, yes, yes. So they have, and a lot of the cemeteries do, I mean, as long as they weren't destroyed or right. discarded. I mean, they have detailed records, but they tell you specifically, you know, this is the plot that this person had purchased, and this right. is where they're buried, and this is when they were interred. And yeah, they have those records, which is, yeah. So it's not like we're just placing the stone in a random spot and hoping he's he's there. Right. Um, yeah. So again, please do click the link in the description of the stream and head on over to the GoFundMe page, which Frank has set up uh, to put a stone on that unmarked grave. Um, you had, you know, you, you obviously have, have good connections with um, finding about where graves are and, and who is there. And some of you may be familiar that I have a prior video on my channel where I've been looking for the grave of the Davidson family, a mother and daughter who were in saloon class aboard the Atlantic, and both of them were killed. In fact, both of them, neither of them even made it out of their cabin, it seems. Um, And I I talk about their grave in a video because there's a photograph of it, and yet it is a dead end. Um, I mentioned that supposedly, according to online records, you know, like Ancestry.com, they are buried in Camp Hill Cemetery in downtown Halifax. But that photograph is certainly not Camp Hill Cemetery. I've even checked the records of Camp Hill Cemetery, and they say that, no, that grave is not there. They have no record of the Davidsons having been buried there. Um, You and I, I, I brought this to you and asked you 
what your opinion is, and you actually helped uncover a little bit on that. Um, now, we're, we're still trying to figure that one out, and I won't go into detail here, but I wanted to let you know, for those of you who were curious about the Davidson grave, because I already saw it come up here in the chat, that's alive again. Um, that's, you know, we're, we're, we're chasing a couple leads um, when we can, and maybe we'll find some sort of an answer to that. Um, yeah, I mean, you never know when you least expect it, you know, you come across. I mean, it, you know, in old newspapers are great obviously right. the, i mean stuff's the the age where we're in now where everything's digitized i mean it i mean it makes a historian's I know. dream come through for a story yeah. i mean a lot of, i remember in graduate school my professor would say you guys really have it made like we actually had to go to the archives and sit there and transcribe everything now you go in there and you take pictures of all the the you know yep. first-hand accounts and letters and you can go online and you have all these newspapers so so you never know if something you know comes up and you find the find a clue that could lead you in one direction i mean you never know what you can find out exactly um so we have at least been able to confirm or at least um, i'm not saying we this was you who found this you have found that um there is confirmation that they are not in camp hill cemetery so at least we've gotten beyond that roadblock um now jumping back to ancient again you said he's in saint john cemetery um interestingly enough that is immediately adjacent to Fairview Lawn Cemetery in Halifax, which is where 121 of Titanic's victims are buried. Um, it's the, uh, the largest collection of Titanic graves in the world. Many of them are unidentified. Some of them are identified. There's the, um, there's the famous Jay Dawson, uh, who a lot of people think is Jack, but is, is not. He's actually a trimmer. Um, there's Bruce Ismay's assistant there, there's the unknown child, and Reverend Ancient's cemetery is immediately adjacent to it. It's the same parking lot, I believe. I don't even think there's a fence dividing them. In fact, if you're walking around the property, you, you can easily just head into St. John Cemetery and not really know it, if I recall correctly. Um, but it is within a two-minute walking distance from Titanic's graves which is kind of neat because I know uh, a lot of the people who are here also are interested in the Titanic. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that was neat yeah, for I mean, me. I didn't know that when I, when you told me where he was buried, I didn't know that this was the I same mean, it's thing. it's crazy. The cemeteries really are living museums. They I mean, are. You could just walk around and if, find out so much about someone. I mean, I use them, even headstones in my research. I mean, there's information on the headstones sometimes yeah. you won't find in the archives. And just, it could tell you so much just based on their actual headstone and the iconography on the headstone about them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, you just walk around and sometimes you just run into individuals, um, you know, that you least expect. I mean, I was just researching a guy that fought in the Mexican War, uh, and he had written a book about his experiences. He was a doctor, and I found out that he was buried in Milwaukee. Yeah, I were outside of Milwaukee. I'm like, that's like, you know, 30 minutes from me. So I went to his grave last week. <laughs> wow. Because I'm like, wow. You know, and you, it's just, it's unbelievable. You yeah. know, you, you're, you can't really get closer to any history than oh, that being at someone's grave, I don't think. Yeah, when I, when I first went up to Halifax and visited Titanic's graves, it was, it was chilling. And it was the, one of the first times that I, I felt an overwhelming connection to, to the disaster. And it's the same with the Atlantic. It's the same with going out to the wreck site and visiting the graves connected to it as well. Um, we did get a super chat from Historic Travels. How you doing, buddy? Um, I am surprised that the Atlantic isn't mentioned more when discussing the Titanic. I have yet to visit a Titanic museum that even mentioned it. Why do you feel that this wreck has been mostly forgotten? Um, actually, as we were saying earlier in the chat, there is one museum that I know of that does mention both. Um, and that's the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic up in Halifax, which I mentioned that because that's actually the one where Frank first heard about it. Um, but the Atlantic, the Atlantic doesn't have the same romance attached to it as the Titanic. It wasn't its first voyage. It wasn't necessarily called unsinkable, even though it did have watertight compartments. Um, there was nobody famous on board, and it was... 
during a time when shipwrecks were kind of frequent and there was nothing there was nothing about the Atlantic that you look at it and you, you can say that shouldn't have happened to that ship with the Titanic you can you look at such a massive object that the whole world was was already thinking about uh, given its size and its prestige and and then it just goes down and it's it's shocking and it took 1500 with it the Atlantic was just another ship it was the largest ship in the world at one point, but there was always a largest ship coming out like every other week. Um, so when the Atlantic went down, it, it hardly even made it into some newspapers in the U.S. And if it did, it was a, a footnote. Or in other parts of the world, I think in Australia, it was just a footnote as well. Um, so the Atlantic was just at a time when people look at that and, yeah, it's sad, but these things happen with the Titanic they were so confident that they were beyond that now um, I think that's just one of the many reasons but the Atlantic is um, I also don't think anything changed after it there were no mass reforms to maritime safety or policies in fact there weren't even too many policies in existence prior to um, the Atlantic disaster so there just was not as much resulting from the disaster. I don't know. This It's uh, rambling at this point. It's not a coherent thought, but you know what I mean, and, and you know what I'm getting at. Frank, do you uh, have any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I always think it's the greater, I mean, it sounds bad, but the greater tragedy yeah. overshadows another tragedy. I mean, that's like I was mentioning with the Mexican War. It's the same thing. At that time, the Mexican War was like, you know, that was... You know, this was the Great War that was being fought, you know, in the 1840s. But as soon as the Civil War came around, I mean, that was even more catastrophic. Yeah. So it just kind of pushed that to the back, and that gets the attention. I mean, it's the same with all other factors you mentioned. I just think, you know, yeah. that's the greater greater tragedy gets the more attention. Absolutely. It gets more attention. It just becomes old news. Yeah. Yeah hate to say it you know it's, it doesn't make the uh, the lives that were lost any any less valuable but um you move on and then comes the next tragedy um we do have another question from j.a bristol uh, have you done any other unmarked graves from the atlantic disaster beside ancient no this is this is the first one um i'm, I'm open to it though i mean i you know if we can get this done for sure i'd be open to it well, if we find the Davidsons, I might be hitting you up for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. If we can pinpoint where they are for sure, then yeah, yeah I mean, I'm all for it. Um, it might I mean, be. there's always, you know, if, if you can if there are instances where individuals are buried, they're not, you can't find their remains, so say, like, they're lost, they were lost at sea, like we were talking about Biles a little bit. I mean, you could always put a memorial stone somewhere too mm -hmm. i mean it's nice to actually have a stone at their actual grave but yeah. and i've done this here in the u.s a little bit um there's some veterans that one for example william gamble he was a union general he died after the civil war um, on his way to california in nicaragua mm -hmm. um, he died in the cemetery that he's buried and ended up being over time i guess from what i understand the sea ended up or the ocean ended up covering it up and there's nothing left there. So mm -hmm. the VA considered that as missing, like a missing remain, and he was eligible to get an actual memorial stone. So I had a memorial stone put in the town he had lived in, mm -hmm. or near the town he had lived in, Illinois. Um, and it says, like, in memory of. And it, it's still, it's a headstone. It, you know, his body might not necessarily be there, but it's still remembering him for what he did. Um, but, like you said, it's nice to have... You know, when you're that, you feel like you're so close to finding where someone's buried to actually find that location and put it on that spot. That's, I'm sure it's very satisfying. You feel like you're doing a good thing. Now, Frank, sure. um, do you have a name for your organization that you do? Like, are you a part of an organization? Is it is it your own entity? What is it? So, it, yeah, it's my own entity. It's called Shrouded Veterans. Um, and I have a Facebook page. And I kind of post like updates of the graves that I'm working on or the graves that um, I had rescued. I, I put a picture of the new headstone. I kind of give a little bio of the person. Um, 
So yeah, I've been, I started it. It's kind of funny how I started it. I was actually researching a guy I was writing about that fought in the Mexican war was killed. And I, his, I found out he was buried at congressional cemetery in Washington. And that's when I found out he had no headstone at his grave. Mm-hmm. So I contacted the cemetery and said, Hey, like, is there a way we can get a headstone? And then they turned me on to the VA saying, Hey, you know, you can request headstones um, from them. They will place them. Um, you just need to have the appropriate paperwork. You need to prove he's buried here and this and this. And so I ended up doing it. And since then it's kind of spiraled into me looking all over the United States or the world at this point in the world. I mean, I just had a stone done in, uh, um, well, it hasn't been placed yet, but it's sent, it was sent shipped up there in uh, Montreal. There was a civil war veteran, uh, a general really? that died and yeah, and he moved to Montreal. Um, yeah. And another, I just had a Canadian in, we was born in Canada. He ended up moving to Vermont, fought in the civil war at the 10th Vermont and moved to Iowa and died in Iowa. Um, and he had an unmarked grave. I just had a grave that had mm-hmm. stone put on his grave. Wow. Um, but I mean, I say me, really, it's all these other people involved. I, I mean, I, I'm going through, I'm handling like the, the paperwork and the background research and stuff. They're the ones actually going out there and putting the headstone on the grave. So I couldn't do that without people that are doing this. Mm-hmm. And that's the cemetery, people working at the cemeteries, um, you know, their staffs and willing to do it, you know, the hard labor, um, I mean, I would be more than happy to participate in it, but a lot of times I haven't even placed any stones yet in Wisconsin, so they're all over everywhere else except here. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a link to your Facebook in the description after this, oh. after the stream so that if anybody who's watching this back wants to go and give you a like, I know I'm going to go do that right after as well. Um, oh, cool. So Thank do you. check that out. And again, one last reminder, because I do want to wrap this up in a couple minutes, um, keep this to about an hour. Um, but again, please do go to the GoFundMe link in the description and give what you can to help put a gravestone on Reverend Ancient's grave in Halifax, which is currently unmarked. Um, and whoever contributes the, the largest amount over this weekend, I will send two tokens of, of thanks. Um, one, again, um, I know I'm, I'm recapping from the beginning, but there's new people tuning in. One is a piece of porcelain that I found at the wreck of the SS Atlantic. This was a part of a China shipment within her forward cargo hold. Um, It was Hotel China that broke open during the wreck and scattered. And this is a piece that I picked up. It is authentic. It is not White Star Line China, though. And in addition to that, a... a, a piece of metal, I think it's a nail that's been quite corroded and distorted, that is a piece of Reverend Ancient's Church, which he was the priest of at the time, um, St. Paul's Church in Lower Prospect, or uh, Terrence Bay, I think. But please contribute, and over the weekend, if... um, if you have contributed the highest, please contact me through email on my YouTube page, and we'll get that set up. So, um, any other questions? Let's see. I know um, I know somebody was asking a, a couple of times what your favorite grave that you placed in your entire career was. Oh, man. That, yeah. That's tough. I, I would love to get these ones done uh, overseas, the one in Peru mm-hmm. and the one in Colombia. Um, but I, I would say probably my favorite I guess I was mentioning the William Gamble grave. I mean, he's technically not buried in the location, but I'm, I'm a huge fan of Gettysburg, the movie. Yeah. And if you've seen Gettysburg, the movie, and you Sam Elliott is in Gettysburg, the movie. He's John oh, yeah. Buford. One of his officers is William Gamble. So he's with these two colonels and the guy talking. Um, he's played by Buck Taylor. Um, he's got the mutton chops. That's William Gamble. And he had a significant okay. role in the battle of Gettysburg. Um, but I mean, they're so, like I said, I kind of have a special place in my heart for the guys who are in the Mexican War or guys who had died, um, you know, kind of, you know, in poor circumstances, you know, not, not everyone, not all these veterans were distinguished, you know, they don't, they didn't have these long lists of battles they fought and some of them just went into the service and three months later, their horse slipped, they fell and they hurt their back and they suffered for that the yeah. rest of their lives. You know, and that was their Civil War service. So those types of guys I really appreciate, you know, memorializing. Because they don't have, a lot of times people don't really 
care to put a veteran headstone on them because their names aren't they aren't the Lees and the Grants and of the war, you know. Yeah. Uh, somebody is asking if there are, um, is it just foundations of Reverend Ancient's church that are left today? Uh, was it a fire that destroyed it? Yes, it, it, um, it did burn down. I forget the exact date. I think it was 30s or 40s. It is documented. I just don't recall offhand. And there's a photograph of it burning down. Um, I don't know where you can find that photo aside from on the display board that's in the park at the old church site. It is just stone foundations. It was quite a small church, believe it or not. And, uh, it, I don't know, probably about 20 by 15 feet. Very, very small. There's nothing else left. In fact, they installed benches, memorial benches, within the foundations. Um, but other than that, that's, that's all that's left. Um, all right. Um, well, Frank, is, is there anything else you want to mention before we conclude this? No, I just wanted to thank, you know, you and the Titanic Society of Atlantic Canada and the SS Atlantic Heritage Museum for really, you know, kind of helping me out and connecting me with people and um, encouraging me to keep going, you know, with this and and everyone who's contributed. I mean, it's awesome to see people coming together and try to make something like this happen. Well, those are both excellent societies. And I know they're very excited to see a grave marker get placed as well. Um so, and somebody has confirmed that the church burned down in the 60s, the 1960s. Thank you very much. There's a new church standing there, by the way. Um, it's called New St. Paul's. So there's old St. Paul's and new St. Paul's. All right, everybody. Uh, please do jump in to that GoFundMe and uh, show some support. Help uh, get Reverend Ancient the recognition that he deserves and, and help Frank in doing so. Um, Thank you very much, everybody, for, for tuning in. And thank you, Frank, as well, for, for jumping on and, and having this nice chat. Uh, I very much enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to talking again. Um, thank you. Yep. Thank you, everybody, as well. And I will see you guys later.